Hi, everybody. I'm Sandra Grancy, Family and Community Health Sciences Educator for Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Hunterdon County. And Belinda. Hi, I'm Belinda Chester, and I am the Master Gardener Coordinator in Atlantic County. Ah, but she's also a red, she's also a Family and Community Health Sciences um, Master Food Preserver. So that is yes. why she's here. She's here in that capacity <laughs> this evening. Uh, so um, I see we have 22 people. Uh, if you want to uh, type in your questions, that's we love to answer specific questions you have. Uh, we do, you know, we are happy to just talk about food preservation. So uh, we can do that as well. If you want to raise your hand, I think I can unmute you if you prefer to answer the question that way. Do we have any questions to start? All right, so I'm uh -oh. going to ask the question of our presenters, and I think I'll start with um, Joanne. What do you think is the easiest uh, food preservation method for beginners? I would say freezing because um, we don't have to do a lot of preparation steps for freezing. We uh, sometimes wash the product and pat it dry. Sometimes we don't wash the product. Ziploc bags are usually freezer Ziploc bags are your very best friend when it comes to uh, freezing. So it's kind of one of those things that if you have space in your freezer, you might want to give it a try. And this time of year, perfect time to try just a few things. You know, blueberries, they freeze so well. Um, that's a really good starting point. So I'm not sure if anybody else wants to chime in with that. Anybody um, have a different opinion or some other idea no, for beginners? No, I agree with Joanne in that what I like about freezing is that you have complete control over the portion size. So how much you want to freeze. If you have a little bit of produce from your garden, you can freeze it. You don't have to worry about making large Powder. batches. So it's a, I think it's very um, just user-friendly and easy to adapt to, um, you know, different meal sizes. So if you have a large family, if you have a small family, you can plan your portion sizes and your, your uh, meal sizes. So it's, it's really, it's really easy that way. Terrific. I do have one Somebody person who's hear. having a hard time hearing. So let's all speak up. So a couple of things. Um, one question is, what is the benefit of not washing, not washing um, before you start to preserve the produce? Uh, I'm gonna, who wants to handle that one? Well, go ahead, Sandra. Belinda. Oh, me? Sandra, what do you think about not washing produce before you well, preserve it? Well, it's, it's, that's one of the very first places that we start when we're talking about safe home food preservation washing mm -hmm. our fresh produce is essential, especially if you're bringing it in from your garden. I mean, you're pulling it up from the ground or you're splattering soil, um, other things on it. So we, we have to start with clean produce and as well as mm -hmm. clean hands, clean surfaces, like all of those basic um, home sanitation practices. Yeah. About, can I clarify there? Um, the only thing that we may not wash sometimes, and it depends, um, I still wash it, would be blueberries. Um, if you want right. them to be um, frozen individually, like on a sheet pan or something, and then put them in a bag that works really well. So you can just grab a handful of berries if you want them for something. That's the only thing. But um, if, if you do rinse them, and I honestly, I do like to do to rinse them anyway, just to make sure they're not real soppy wet. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, blueberries don't absorb the, the water. So they're not going to be terribly wet. But other, other fruits may get soggy, right? When you talk about like right. strawberries. Yeah, I agree. You don't want to put them in the freezer. You don't want to put any uh, fruit or vegetables in the freezer wet. So yes. it's always good to um, at least pat them dry if you are going to rinse them or let them dry in a colander. 
because what no, will happen no. whenever you get them wet is they'll you'll get the crystallization of the ice and right. it actually reduces the amount of time that you can preserve it frozen yeah. exactly so we have another related question on freezing we'll try to get to each of these um questions as kind of a chunk where we can uh, how would I freeze string beans and do I have to blanch them first? And related to that, what foods do you absolutely need to blanch for freezing? Um, because there seems to be a various um, opinions. Belinda, you want to start? Um, so I'll take the green beans, but I, I actually don't know the whole list off the top of my head of uh, vegetables that you, uh, I'll look that up you the need to blanch. blanch. Time while you do that. <laughs> But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take an opportunity for a moment, and I hope you can see these. I do have two books that I just wanted. These are ones that we use often, and one is the Ball Home Preserving book, which unfortunately you can't see because my background. Let me turn that off for a second. Um, so the Ball Home Preserving book, and that one has a list of everything that you would need to blanch. Um, so here's this one. Here we go. Yep. Uh -huh. And um, then the second thing I have is not one, this is actually one that you can print out on your own, um, but I buy it all bound just because it's easier for me and it's all nice and put together. I think I got this on Amazon, but I can't remember. I, know, I don't know if you guys can see that, uh -huh. but this is just a complete guide to home canning that the USDA puts out. Again, you can print this one out on your own on their website. It's a free publication, but, uh, or you can find it um, on a book site where someone has bound it for you and it's all, um, together. Again, those are, so those are places that you can find those. Um, you can find lists of, uh, what needs to be blanched and what doesn't. Um, green beans, I generally do blanch and it's because of the enzymes on there to make sure that, um, you know, it, it really does have to do with the texture whenever you go to reheat them later. Um, I, I don't know if someone else wants to take other vegetables. I know cauliflower, you do also want to um, blanch. And um, honestly, most of my vegetables I do. I obviously, fruits I don't, but, um, but most of my vegetables I do a quick blanch on um, before I freeze them. Can I, can so I add another? Oh, blanching ahead. time is three minutes for green beans. Oh, thank and you, I'll Sandra. Add another resource that we use a lot, which is the yes. so easy to preserve book from Cooperative Extension, the University of Georgia, which is um, really a, a kind of really nice combination of a like a cookbook, but also a home food preservation manual. And there are tables and uh, guidance for every type of fruit or vegetable. So there are recommendations for what to blanch, what, how to blanch, how long to blanch. So I would recommend if you're not sure, checking one of these resources and it will, it will tell you, and the goal is to get the best possible product when you have frozen the particular food and then are um, consuming it later on. So that's really the goal of blanching. Right. So somebody asked, is the purpose to reduce enzyme activity? That's one of them, it, it, mm -hmm. which causes food to deteriorate in terms of color and texture and flavor. So you want to stop that activity. And then the other, it does kill su surface, you know, microorganisms and it makes food um, pliable. So it's easier right. to fit into bags. I think the only thing that I don't blanch are peppers, both bell and hot mm -hmm. peppers seem to freeze pretty well without blanching and tomatoes. Otherwise yeah. I blanch all the foods for the same reasons. Um, how can I, okay, so that's, let's see here. Those are freezing questions. All right, so we do have a couple of questions about um, canning and this would be canning and glass uh, canning jars with two piece lids. So can I layer jars in a water bath canner? Meaning, I assume they mean stacking. What do you think, Joanne? Um, I say that is not a safe practice and it's not recommended. Just stay away from it. Uh, I know it takes longer to do whatever your canner fits, eight jars at a time or whatever, seven jars or six jars at a time, but that's the way you should do it. Yep. Um, how do I prevent my green beans from floating? 
If you're Sorry. talking about canning, um, usually if the food is hot packed, and again, you're gonna follow the directions in your um, guide. And I'm gonna show you, I'll pull up a screen of our Rutgers page that has all links to all these resources. But if you hot pack green beans or peaches, they tend, it tends to get rid of some of the extra air that's within the food, and then it doesn't float as much. Um, and, and tightly, really tightly packing your jars. Right. And removing as right. much air as you can uh, to make sure you're not losing headspace, things like that. Okay. Um, I think this is a good question to kind of address in a general way that came up. Uh, said lots of videos and um, lots of YouTube videos on food oh. preservation. So um, who wants to comment on find, where do you find those good recipes? We kind of alluded to that and I'm gonna pull up my screen so we can share a few things. Can I talk about this only because it's my number one pet peeve? <laughs> sure, go. Okay, um, I have to say that I am a lurker in many Facebook groups on food preservation, not to you know be a pain in the neck. I often don't comment, but I just wanna see what information is being exchanged? Because over the you know over the past fifteen months with the pandemic, home food preservation has really skyrocketed in interest. So a lot of people have never preserved food at home are now looking for methods and uh, information. So I have to say, I highly recommend you start with one of the uh, evidence-based resources that we showed you. So look up a method that you plan to use and look at the procedure so that you're familiar with it. And then you will know that all the important criteria. So whether, you know, how long, what type of processing, do you need to add acid? What size jars, the um, hot pack versus cold pack? Because a lot of the information in casual groups and in YouTube videos can be wrong can be non-evidence-based and it can be just based on, you know, an individual sharing practices that, you know, they may have learned, which may not be up to current scientific standards. So I think it's best rather than to go to these groups and say, is this accurate? Start with an evidence-based method and then you will be guaranteed to know the proper way. So I pulled up our NJAES website. Uh, it's njaes.rutgers.edu. And maybe you, we'll, we'll top this, the, type it in the chat and we can send it to you later. Um, the home food preservation page on that website has a resource list. So there we list um, some, they're not the only ones, but usually we go to the government or to a university. So we have um, the ones that, everybody's mentioned here tonight. And then this is a really good one, the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Clicking on it so you see it. I'll admit it's, um, you know, it's not as fancy as some other sites, but it is, we know it's accurate. It is reviewed regularly and it is a wealth of good information. So they have frequently asked questions, publications. So if you just want to know, how, oops, um, yeah. How do I, well, here's a good one. Here, how do I freeze? You could go to a specific product and it tells you how to freeze beets. Mm -hmm. If you want to know um, step-by-step -step for um, canning, the best place probably is to go to the um, University of Georgia. And then they have things, if you just want to know how to do jams and jellies, they have really nice fact sheets and everything you need to know about doing jams and jellies is there. So it's a great resource. And the fact that they, we know it's been reviewed by um, scientists on a regular basis tells us that the methods will give you a high quality and safe product. So I highly encourage you to check that out. And it's an easy way to um, get to um, all sorts of resources. We also are going to have some videos up there Shortly, we've been having some technical difficulties, but all the webinars we've done on all these topics will be there for your um, viewing in the future. I'm going back to this. Um, so someone asked, 
said they're doing a program, teaching a program about fermenting. And I guess they wanted to do some sort of demonstration. Um, they were thinking, would pickles be a good thing to demonstrate? Any thoughts, Joanne? Um, yeah, I think pickles are a good starting point because they're, they're fairly easy to do. Um, you know, look at, look for the directions from these really good sources and follow them to the T and you shouldn't have any problem. I think pickles are, are a pretty good starting spot sometimes. I think jam is a great starting point too mm -hmm. for, uh, for canning, uh, for pickling. Uh, I'm a big fan of bread and butter pickles or, you know, dill pickles. They're, they're not that complex. And you may want to tweak the results down the road. I'm just saying you may, you know, you may find the recipe that works best for you, but please don't always believe everything you see online. Um, some of the, some of the websites that are, um, you know, pro canning, let's say, but not following the, uh, the regulations and guidelines by USDA can be quite convincing, but you need to really take, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Start with the, the good sources, good sources, meaning USDA, University of Georgia, Ball Book, they're the best. Yeah, um, absolutely. Those are, those are really good um, recommendations. And I just want to put in a plug for, I mean, if you think that Fermented pickles are a little complicated, which I think they can be. You know, you can start with, you know, Daryl, the ones that you did your video on refrigerator pickles right. are some. Of, like, I was going to say the same thing. Right. Yes. Like to really super easy. Um, so you can do pickles in stages, you know, different level of complexity, but refrigerator yeah. pickles, I'm going to be honest, my kids prefer them because they stay, we consume them quickly. You're not mm -hmm. heating them. So the, the produce stays pretty crisp. And um, we can, and, uh, there's a situation where you can really, because because it's going to be refrigerated, it's not going to be held at room temperature. You know, you can really be creative with your brine. Yeah. So um, I, right. I really like refrigerator pickles. Yeah, good. Well, since we're talking about pickles, um, I had some other questions. Why are pickles softer? when you home can them, then you might get in a supermarket. Joanne, you want to finish that one? <laughs> or Belinda looks like she, Belinda Belinda. looks like she's ready. Go ahead, Belinda. For that one. I was going to say, it really does have to do with the, the process. The process for um, canning commercially is much different than the process for canning at home. So um, you're actually going to can them a little bit longer at home because the temperature is different and the timing is different. Um, the machinery you're using is completely different. So, um, you know, when they're commercially canning them, they can actually um, do them for a short period of time. So you're not cooking them as long, but they're at a different temperature. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to step in on that, but it really does have to do with the process and the timing being different from home to commercial. So with home, um, you know, the, the process of cooking any vegetable is going to make them softer. So because you mm -hmm. have to can them for, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, that's going to make the, the vegetable a little bit softer than it would otherwise. Um, okay, that, that, yeah, that's, um, I agree. Totally agree with that. So we do the best we can, and I think they're pretty good. There are um, additives available on the market. They say pickle crisping agents. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, if you read the um, like University of Georgia's publications, most of them don't work really all that well. They don't make right. a huge difference, and for the most part, for the amount of work that's required to use those, it's a soak, rinse, 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 several million steps. <laughs> um, most would say it's probably not worth the, the um, piece. But here's a good question. Someone said when pressure canning, how bad is it when the pounds of pressure go above the identified amount? I feel like I turn around and it zooms up immediately. So I assume maybe you're pressure canning something at 11 pounds and you look away and now you look back and it's up at 15 pounds or 16 pounds. What do you think about that? Or what should we, how can that we control that? Yeah, 
oh, we've stopped everybody. <laughs> well, I would say make sure that your dial is correct for one thing. And if it's because you're not paying attention to the pressurization, that could be another thing. Um, the heat source will have an impact if you're exactly your heat is not steady. Um, yep. You know, in a gas, you get a really quick lift of the heat. So if you turn it up just a little and you're not paying attention, it'll you're jump not paying attention. Quickly. Right. And in the same vein on an electric stove, you know, you turn the heat down, it takes a while to come down. So finding that sweet spot is, mm -hmm. is a bit of a challenge, but we do want to keep, it's really important to keep your pressure stable or jars can um, lose liquid and they don't seal properly mm -hmm. or the product within them will not be safe. So it, you want to keep an eye on that and learn with your own stove, how it works well with the pressure. And, and you know what, I agree. I have seen the pressure go up um, at times and you have to keep your eye on it. You need to mm -hmm. be focused on what you're doing and watch that, you know, turning around, right. doing something else, just take a second. You really need to just pay attention to it. Stay focused. And we, we can say the same thing even about the water bath process. So you gotta keep your eye on that boil as well. Yeah, and if I think, um, I think my would, uh, what would work too with a pressure canner is if you wanted to kind of get, test your canner out after you've read the whole manual, um, you can put some empty jars in there with, you know, a little bit of water and then, you know, play with how it works before you actually do the feed. Hey, Daryl, there's a question about testing the, uh... <laughs> I'm going to let you handle that one. That's your favorite question. Testing okay, the so, um, gauge. testing your gauges. The <laughs> yeah. recommendation is that you test them every year um, because your canner is only as accurate as that dial. And this, I'm only talking about dial gauges. So the gauge that has the mm -hmm. hand that goes around. Not if you have a canner that just has a weight on it, no dial, you don't have to test those. So the dial gauge testers. Um, currently... I have one, I'm in Somerset County, New Jersey in Bridgewater. Uh, you could call and make an appointment. It doesn't take very long. I can test most can dials. I just need the lid and or just the dial. Occasionally we've had some models that don't fit. It's the testers put out by Presto. So they don't only really guarantee it fits perfectly on their Presto equipment, but it seems to work well on most. Every so often something has not worked. Joanne, I think, is going to inherit a canner tester down in Atlantic <laughs> um, County at some point, so you could reach out to her. But I think that's it for the state at the moment. Um, some companies might be willing to test the gauge if you know, reach out to them uh, by email or phone and see if they would test it if you mail it to them, and they may or may not charge for that service. New canners, if you just go out and buy one, even if it's, I checked with the, one of the manufacturers just recently, you don't have to test the dial before you start. They're, they test them before they leave the factory. Um, likewise, if you drop it, you know, that's another reason it may not be accurate. Um, Allison typed something about where can I locate that? I'm a dietetic intern and I'd love to make them. Oh, you mean, so can you just, Allison P, would you just type in what you're talking about? If you're talking about refrigerator pickles, I'll tell you um, where you can find that in a minute. Do we recommend any specific canner? The answer is no, we don't recommend any specific brand. There aren't very many um, manufacturers for any of these things. So um, either dial or weighted gauge both work well. There's no difference in accuracy as long as the dial is accurate. Personally, I would choose to buy a weighted gauge because then I don't have to worry about testing the dial. But okay, refrigerator pickles, I'll tell you where to find it. Um, yeah, refrigerator pickles are easier to demo. That's true. Uh -huh. <laughs> no canning, canning card. And they and you can't can what the recipes and things that we do for that. It's not 
a recipe suitable for canning. It's just refrigerator. Um, let's see here. I think there was a question on dehydrating. Um, oh, go for oh, it. yeah, we missed that one. Any, uh, I think it's kind of general. Any thoughts on dehydrating? My, I do have some thoughts on it. I actually love to dehydrate a lot in the summer. Um, really, when we start to get to this time of year where um, I start to have more than I can use in um, a short period of time is when I really start to use my dehydrator a lot. Um, and I use it a lot in the fall too for apple chips and, um, and things like that. So um, the only thing I would say um, that, for me personally, as a drawback is um, dehydrating meats. I find that to be difficult. So if you're going to start dehydrating, I wouldn't start with um, jerkies. I would, you know, that, that's a more advanced skill. I would start with, um, you know, some easy things like mushrooms or um, some of your vegetables that don't have as much water would be something that I start with. And then, um, you know, when you're comfortable with that, then move on to, um, you know, zucchini and tomatoes and things like that. But always keeping in mind that um, in our area, it's typically very humid, especially this time of year. So um, some of your dehydrating times might be a little bit longer. Um, and, um, you want to do um, a little bit smaller batches because if you try to do several trays at once, um, you'll find that it takes so long for you to dehydrate them that um, sometimes some of the food might spoil. I tried one time to do, um, I was being really ambitious and I put 12 trays on at once and I think I got probably two usable trays, even though I was rotating constantly and everything, it just took too long because the vegetables had too much moisture. So something to keep in mind, some of the, some dehydrators will say you can have nine to 12 trays. Um, and I don't recommend that. Um, not in this area. If you're in a very dry climate, that might work. But if you're in a climate like ours, where it's very humid, um, particularly the coast of New Jersey, um, when you're when you're a very humid climate, you would not want to go with that many trays. So, but it's a really easy um, thing to learn as far as dehydrating, and something that um, you know once you learn that you can jar it, you can have it all year. You can make soups. You can make all kinds of layered. Um, jars so um it's really versatile too um fruits uh we've made our own we dry blueberries this time of year just because we think it's fun not because they taste any different or whatever um <laughs> we do it for fun and then we um you know you can rehydrate them um if you want to be really fun with rehydrating your fruits you can rehydrate rehydrate them in water or um, you can rehydrate them in liquors or fruit juice or anything to add some extras to it. So you can kind of play around, play around with it as well. I think um, I, I've learned a lot from Belinda over the past few years about dehydrating and I like dehydrating. Um, I think herbs are a really good starting point if you mm -hmm. have an abundance of herbs because they're fairly easy and have a, depending on the herb, a relatively short dehydration right. time but you still need to do what Belinda said and limit the number of trays and keep an eye on the trays and rotate them too, because um, it, it just takes longer. If you're, if you just kind of turn it on, mm -hmm. let it go. Oh, I'll check it in the 12 or 21 hours. It says you may be a little disappointed, but dehydration is fun. I like it too. So kind of a follow-up, they wanted to know, do you weigh items before and then weigh them to get a certain percentage of dryness? That's being very precise. I think you probably, there are probably are directions to do that, but how do you yes. tell when things like a tomato are dehydrated enough? Do you want to comment on that, Belinda? Um, to be honest, tomatoes are one that, that is actually really difficult. Um, but if you, what I would do um, is each, uh, it's a percentage and I believe it's, um, is it 2%? Um, yeah, I don't usually, that's very precise. If you want to weigh it, I don't weigh it. Um, I look for particularly like if I'm doing apples, I look for them to get, um, to the point that there's no moisture as far as, um, you know, in a regular dehydrator, you're not going to get a crispy apple. You're going to get an apple that's still soft, but there's no moisture in it. Um, and the thing that you want to do is um, get it to the point, there'll be specific times in the books that we mentioned and the websites we mentioned 
for different types of fruits and vegetables. Um, there'll be an, an estimated time there. Um, start looking a little bit, you know, start checking it. Um, I would say an hour or two, depending on what you're, you know, if it's something with a longer time period, I would start checking it an hour beforehand um, just to see, you know, it, it may go a little faster for you or it may take a little bit longer. Um, and uh, you, you don't want it to be so brittle that it just turns into powder but you also wanna make sure that it's not gonna collect any uh, moisture in the jar. So you can test that by going ahead and jarring it up or however you're going to store it um, and then test it um, 24 hours later or 48 hours later and look to make sure there's no moisture. And if you do see moisture, then um, go, put it back in and dehydrate it some more. Um, one thing I do for things that I really want to be crispy, um, like apple chips or zucchini chips or something like that is I'll do most of the work in a dehydrator um, or I have done it in a small um, air fryer. And then from there, I put it in the oven and that'll crisp it up a little more. So it's going to take a little more moisture out of there. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, it's say in conventional, you know, home methods, you can't get that crisp thing. So they did right. ask the question about using the oven and I, I might've missed that for the dehydrating, but generally, unless your oven has a particular setting for that, it's not very energy efficient. You need a fan, it's on for a very long time at a, a low temperature, otherwise it cooks and doesn't dehydrate. So right. oven is not good, except I have used a hot oven for um, using the residual heat to dry, say some herbs like parsley or basil. Um, but Someone asked, they're drying their herbs on cookie sheets lined with paper towels and just air drying. Joanne, uh, is this not safe? Do you want to comment on that? Um, I think I think Belinda alluded to this when she was talking about the, the humidity in the air, especially uh, maybe in New Jersey and in the coastal areas, that it's really not the safest of practices. So I, I'd like to see what Belinda has to say. Uh, that's that's actually pretty much what I was going to say. It, it's going to take a really long time. And the paper towel is not, it's going to absorb the moisture, but it's also just going to be kind of sitting in moisture as well. Um, if you have a really dry space in your house, like a basement or something like that, you can hang them to dry um, to, to, um, to help absorb some of that moisture. You can put a bag around it and tie it. Um, that will help some, but um, Generally speaking, I've not been successful with it drying fast enough um, in this area, but I do live along the coast as well. So um, yeah. there may be yeah. some places up in Northwest New Jersey where that would be possible. Yeah, and I think uh, that's a good method for some herbs. You can put them in a bag, usually poke some holes in it and put it in a hot, dry place and maybe your basement, but I'm thinking attic. I'm thinking attic. A garage, a right. yeah. shed. The bag keeps the dust and the most of the insects off. It also Add keeps hair. any seeds from dropping down to the floor. Um, but the dehydrators, so if you're going to do it a lot, a dehydrator works really well. The, the um, big issue with herbs is getting them to dry before they mold. So if they, if they, if the moisture lingers on them and there's not good air circulation, you may get mold before they thoroughly dry. So you've got to find right. that right place to hang them. Um, the, the same thing if, you, if you're dehydrating, not necessarily herbs, but if like those tomatoes and you don't take enough moisture out of them and you put them in a glass jar, um, you know, and you come back in a week and you see drops of moisture. So if you just left them out on your counter, eventually those would mold because you've left too much moisture in them. So that's why you need to check to make sure that you don't have residual moisture left and put them back into the dehydrator and get more of that moisture out. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the, um, the books that you showed there in the list, Daryl, really, you need to become familiar with them, no matter what you're doing, freezing, dehydrating, canning, and see what they're saying about it and looking at what is considered safe practices. and. You know, you don't want to take a lot of time to do something that you really uh -huh. look forward to and find uh, it didn't work. Right. So, right. You know, just go the best route possible to get the best product in the end. Yeah. Um, it's all an good advice. Question. You, mm -hmm. So there was a couple other um, questions here. Um, 
Should you pair cucumbers before making re refrigerator pickles? That's not necessary. You could I usually slice them pretty thin. And about the video, that's um, not quite up yet. So I will send an email to you, everyone, with the, um, the link to that video. It should be up shortly. So apologize, I just did a quick look. Uh, do I have a, do we have a safe quality canning recipe for recipe for elderberry syrup? So I'm gonna take a quick look you know, in the one book. I was just looking, that's what I was looking for before. And um, um, I thought that we found something that said that elderberry was not safe to can oh, that's in right. homes. So, was that apply to syrups as well, or was it just elderberries? That was for jam. Can, I'm not for, sure on syrup. Okay, so if so, it's jam, so the, it's close enough. The deal syrup. is for elderberries are not something you can can, whether it's a jam or on our website. I'm going to come back to our website. Oh, I want to see that um, updated yes. notice. So, so back up. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, let's go there. So elderberries, hot off the press a couple of years ago. Where'd it go? Oh, safety. Elderberries are not safe for um, canning. So if you wanted to freeze them, that yeah. would be absolutely safe, no problem. They also say you can't even make um, elderberry jams and jellies and can them. Uh, you could probably use a freezer jam recipe and freeze them. And you could make elderberry syrup and then freeze that it, yeah. because it has a, a fair amount of sugar in it. It's not going to freeze solids. Make sure you use a leak-proof container, but it'll reliquify pretty quickly, I imagine. Um, so it's the canning process. They determined that it's a low acid fruit and they are have not yet um, done the research uh -huh. on the methods to figure out how to compensate for this. So there is a link on our NJAS web home food preservation webpage and it's right up there, safety news and you can learn more um, there as well. But my suggestion is freeze it and I don't, I would think the syrup would freeze really nicely. Uh -huh. Or it'll keep in the refrigerator. refrigerator. It'll yeah. probably keep right. in the refrigerator for several weeks if you're yeah. making a smaller batch. Good question. That what was a good question because elderberries are now uh, like everywhere in um, sort of the health promotion area. Yes. People. Yeah. So we have a question about grandparents used to this store one. edible products in a root cellar over the winter. Any thoughts on this practice? Um, anybody want to weigh in? <laughs> It was usually um, used for yeah. root vegetables, Sandra. Right. Well, I'm just thinking, you know, it depends on, on the temperature in said root cellar. Uh, so, you know, some of them used to get pretty cold and keep a very consistent temperature. So, you know, somewhat like a refrigerator. Right. Yeah. So not all produce needs to be stored in a refrigerator. In fact, some types of, we don't put potatoes in a right. refrigerator. So some vegetables like a potato or maybe some root vegetables. Um, Turnips or rutabagas probably beans, would work rutabaga. in that setting. Uh, right, because they don't, you know, they don't store too well in the refrigerator for too long either. It's moist in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, people did things they had to do. Life was different then. Yeah. Um, and I don't know too many people now that have a, a root cellar, but again, I think you want to look at how if you Look at how things are stored in the in a supermarket. Some produce is stored uh, refrigerated. Some is stored not refrigerated. Uh, so that'll give you a clue as to you know how to store your produce when you bring it home. And, and you may the have, other, I'm thinking uh, like people grow potatoes and Belinda, you're a mess. You may want to chime yeah. in here with the, from the master um, gardener perspective. But people will grow potatoes and they get a bumper crop and. Usually you want to store them in a place that's cool, not cold. So right, right. Uh, most of us don't have root cellars, but I can remember growing up, you know, my mother would keep the extra potatoes in the cellar. It wasn't mm -hmm. hot down there. Right. And we would have potatoes probably through until like December, um, keeping them in a 
like single layers so you could watch to see if they were starting to mold or sprout. But those type, same with onions, you know, you could keep those in a cool, mm -hmm. not cold, but cool. Like place. apples, like you, I know apples, right. yeah. you could keep in a cool so area. So you may have a place in your home, a cellar, maybe a well-insulated garage. Again, you don't want freezing for right. some of those kinds of foods. Um, and they usually, um, depending on what vegetable you're talking about or fruit, there's a, a process of um, setting them out. And like you said, always having them in a single layer where they um, form a natural skin on it that's like a protective barrier as well. Uh, but you always want to watch for sprouting because once they sprout, um, you don't want to cook, you don't want to eat those. Um, you could probably regrow them. But, um, but you wouldn't want to eat them, um, particularly potatoes. Uh, once they start sprouting, um, you're better off to cut them into pieces and um, plant them to make new potatoes rather than eating them. Um, but, uh, you know, even things like your uh, butternut squash, your uh, pumpkins and things like that, they're usually, if you're going to store them for a little while, you put them out, there's a curing process um, you, you know, if you're not going to use them immediately and then you would store them. Thank you. So we have a Curing question about good. canning, canning peaches. Doesn't want to use a lot of sugar. Can I still do that? Who want, and can I keep the skins on peaches for canning? Who wants to tackle that one? Well, if you're canning, you're talking about making, um, you can can in, well, first of all, check for the, for a uh, evidence-based recipe to follow and it will give you your options for canning peaches. So, you know, you, you can can in juice, you can can in different uh, sweetened media. So it depends on, on what you want to do. You can can in water, but you need to follow a recipe that will guide you through your options. You, in some you know, because you're thinking about the final product too, not just safety part, but you want to end up with the most the most uh, delicious final product too. So you don't have to always can in a sweet syrup if that's yeah. what you're asking. And the and there are in the directions in these canning publications. Again, you could go to the University of Georgia's publications. They have canning fruits. You could go, as you said, from one no sugar to all the way up. Sugar right. does help preserve, um, or I should say, improve the texture of the peaches. They'll be softer. Um, certainly it adds flavor, but it, they are softer. If you can in water, they tend to be a little less firm. Um, and Peach same with sugar. freezing. You could freeze with no sugar or you could freeze with more sugar. Um, frozen with sugar, gives you a more pliable fruit when you thaw it. Freezing in water takes longer to thaw. So there are options. Artificial um, uh, sweeteners don't have any effect on texture. They don't have any effect on color. So they're probably better added um, when you serve those products. Skins, and did we address the skin the skins yeah. from canning. Always. I don't believe yeah. you get good penetration of the heat with the skins right. on. So mm -hmm. you raise a good point. If it says remove the skins, and I know it's time consuming, you need to do that. If it says right. cut mm -hmm. it into like it's green beans and it says cut it in half pieces um, and you want to do whole, you have to have the recipe for the whole beans. It changes times. And you'll notice that even when you purchase something like peaches in the store, the skins are removed because the skin texture is going to change in the process of canning. And it's not going to be an appealing texture. No, um, and, and it does going to get wrinkly. Penetration. So yeah, heat, probably heat separate. penetration is important. Um, do you need to add salt to the blanching water? The answer is no. <laughs> Um, salt in canning doesn't have any, except for pickles, but it doesn't have any effect on the safety, its flavor. So you can leave your salt out of all your home canned products, except pickles, because you need that for the flavor. Um, how can we preserve summer squashes like zucchini or bottled gourd? I can tell you the answer to zucchini is 
You may not can it, that's number one. There are no safe canning recipes for zucchini or yellow, any of those summer, summer squash. squashes. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could freeze it. I have frozen the grated zucchini for baking purposes, um, but it's very high in water. It When you thaw it out, it's very watery. So for me, it's a vegetable best used fresh, except I do freeze some for, um, Baking purposes. I don't know if anybody else has an opinion. Yeah, I, um, I, I zucchini is water. something that I use for dehydrating. I will dehydrate it. Um, it's so high in water, though, so you have yeah. to keep that in mind. It's going to take a long time for it to dehydrate. That's one of those that I generally go into the oven so that I pull a little extra water out. Um, and the other thing that I use it for is um, I use this a similar recipe to pickles. And I put the summer squash like zucchini in a pickling liquid and yeah, it is surprisingly it. good. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I have a lot of zucchini this year. I might be doing that. Right. <laughs> zucchini pickles. Yeah. And here people say they make, one person said they make um, soup from a squash I'm not familiar with. Trombone squash. Um, but you could make soups out Trombone. of these things. And then if you make right. a lot, you could freeze the soup. So that's another um benefit from that you yeah, could make yeah, like a lot of bread your, uh, butternut bread. squashes yes, and things like well. that can be pureed and frozen yeah right. i do that too if i have mm -hmm. um if i'm squeezing the liquid out of squash to make uh or zucchini to make like zucchini bread then i save that liquid and put it in the bag in the freezer label it and then when i'm making a soup stock that's one of the things that can go into that so we're not yes. you know we're reducing food waste that way too yeah capturing vitamins mm -hmm. and minerals Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I good. Um, freezing zucchini bread works really well. So yes, yeah. if you're, so yes. I tend to yes. make two late <laughs> two loaves if I'm making it one for one for us to eat and one to freeze for a, a nice cold fall day. So I have a nice thing. Um, yeah, and ratatouille. Good. Someone said that make that's a perfect um, opportunity to freeze it. Ratatouille actually freezes pretty well. Um, yeah. depending on how you're going to use it later, like mm -hmm. whenever you pull it out of the freezer, you're not going to get that same texture and, um, big chunks. So, but you, I mean, it, it still can have good flavor. You just might not have that same texture. So that's kind of a personal preference on what, what texture you're looking for. Yeah. Good point. Um, let's just see. looked up the blanching time for summer squash from the, um, so easy to okay. preserve. So. I'm thinking that if, if you are going to freeze it, and because it's so much water, um, it's going to be attracting, you make, you know, those ice crystals are just going to be mm -hmm. so easy to develop on something that wet. So, but there is a, a, a recommendation here for blanching. If you wanted to blanch it, it's um, summer squash is three minutes in boiling water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will say that I do not blanch the shredded uh, zucchini I use for baking. I measure oh, it no. in yeah. very, um, yeah. so if I need two cups, I measure two cups and label it in the bag so that when I make that bread yeah. it's ready, I do tend to drain it to get rid of some of the extra moisture. As Joanne said, it, you may need to add a little extra moisture to the bread because you're not going to have that same moisture level in the zucchini once it's right. Um, just and. Learn by and for doing those tips. who are wondering, I know that we see um, summer squash like zoodles right now frozen in the um, in the frozen food aisle at the grocery store. Again, that's like a difference in home preservation versus um, it going through a flash freezing process exactly. in commercial processing. Good yeah. point. Excellent. And uh, in case any of you have um, a lot of extra income, you can buy for instance, a food, a freeze dryer for home. So like I always tell people the strawberries, you can use a dehydrated, they're absolutely delicious, but they're not the same bright red you get in a right. commercial freeze dried strawberry because they freeze dry them. So it's much quicker and they can retain color much better. They do make equipment for home, but it's, um, you know, thousands of dollars or eight thousand dollars so um the dehydrator is considerably less maybe a hundred um just your choice but it is available um we didn't talk about jams and jellies any um you know one of the questions i always have people 
when we start to make a jam for a class or in a video, they um, get very upset with the amount of sugar that's going into those jams. Do you have any suggestions? Joanne, you're a big jam and maker. Any thoughts? Well, you know, you can try the low sugar variations, but they still contain sugar. You know, jam is sugar. <laughs> you know, it's sweetened fruit. So um, I don't know. I've tried some shortcuts with using less sugar and it really doesn't work. So I wouldn't recommend it. Don't change the recipe either. You know, follow the directions exactly as they're written and you can buy low sugar product, um, you know, like pectins or something like that. But right, right. You, you follow may, their recipe. Yeah, you have to follow their yeah. recipe. You may not be as happy with the final product. You know, this is one of those things you want to maybe try a batch, experiment with it, see if you like it. And I like, I like to remind people that there is a lot of sugar, but it usually makes, you know, four to six jars and no one is supposed to eat a whole jar at a time. So oh no, is that what you're telling me now? <laughs> and as Sandra would like to remind us many times, you know, it's, it's about some portion control. So if you Moderation. have good, good willpower, you use it, I'll say at least a tablespoon, but a tablespoon probably only has a hundred calories or two. If you sit down with the whole jar, that's a whole nother situation so yeah that's where you're controlling um some of that wonderful sweetness of that and, and there um, are the, lower sugar pectin recipes yes. reduce sugar you know so but again I, I don't have experience with those i'd rather eat a little bit of the regular product yeah yeah I, um, I, how come that we can't put wax on top anymore Good. my grandmother oh. put wax on her jams yeah, but that never worked for me years ago. It never, it never worked. So I'm glad we don't do that. But, you know, I would rather have um, the really good product, like a jam, a homemade strawberry or blueberry jam or whatever it is, and eat it in moderation, than kind of say, well, let me, let me try this other version that I'm not, maybe, maybe not going to be as happy with, you know, we just. And you can try it and, you know, try it. You know that's up to. You have choices at least, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, okay. Honey or, or maple syrup be used. I, I don't know if you're, you're talking about using honey or maple syrup in a, um, a jam recipe. Generally, people use a table sugar because it's uh, kind of neutral in flavor. And both honey and certainly maple syrup have a flavor profile that might compete with the fruit you're using. Um, but Certainly again, that would be somewhat of an experiment yeah. um, that you would have to try. And jams, again, if you're, we're talking that if you're making a jam that you want to keep on the shelf, it has to be processed for five to 10 minutes in a boiling water bath. And the directions will tell you which time to use and how to do that. Questions and if you're preserving... looking for using local honey for the reason of, um, you know, people use it for allergies. So if you were thinking of using for that, the processing time needed for home canning would kind of negate any of that. That's why the, the honey that you purchase in the store is all pasteurized. So um, that's why they say to get a local honey for allergies. So um, just something to think about if you were using it for that, the processing time um, is going to negate those properties in it because um, it's it's a pasteurizing process essentially and i do want to say there's no caloric benefit to substituting mm -hmm. honey or maple syrup yeah yeah or glycemic because... benefit, benefit <laughs> yeah. either yeah so again it goes back to i mean and, and actually i've seen in so easy to preserve that they have they they do make a suggestion i forget exactly where it was if you know if other sweeteners can be substituted you yeah. get what yeah. fruit it may have been or which jam, but um, you can check. I think honey is one that they do have recipes for. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and the artificial sweeteners um, <clears throat> don't usually work that well in some of these recipes, although there are pectin recipes that tell you how much you would use, but the texture may be somewhat different because sugar also adds texture and Bulk. things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Preserving figs. Oh, love figs. Oh, Joanne, I, mean, you I would like to get enough figs? to preserve. I know. That's my right. goal in life. <laughs> I, I agree with you, Sandra. Um, 
I've tried growing them unsuccessfully. You know, my daughter grows some that, and I've given her some of the plants, but the kids eat them, which they should, you know, it's wonderful. Trying to get enough to preserve is a little At one time. Um, yeah. If anybody has an outlet for that, please let me know because I'll I, try it. Love it. I love fig jam, um, but I would make jam out of it. That's mm -hmm. nice too. Um, in fact, I was, I'm looking in the ball book right yeah. now and um, all of their, uh, all of the recipes they have are for jams and preserves. Um, yeah. My grandmother always made fig preserves, um, mm -hmm. but I can't think of any other way that, that even she preserved them. So jams, mm -hmm. preserves, um, you could there freeze. are plenty of I'm testing sure you recipes could freeze. out I'm there. sure you could freeze them. Yes. Yeah. But figs are a um, borderline acidic. Yep. And so canning is a problem. So we, we really, unless you have a, a recipe that's specific for those that's been tested, they are not recommended for canning because they certainly in a boiling water bath or they, because well, they're a low acid group. Actually, I'm seeing here, I don't know if this has been updated, Daryl, but I'm looking that they do have an acidification step. Yeah, they add, le they add like lemon, the lemon juice. juice yeah. Like right. you would for tomatoes. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really and usually wondering. in a high sugar uh, preservation. Yeah. What yeah. would you do with jams or excuse me, with figs that are canned? What would you do with that, Belinda? Give me some ideas. Um, I, I've, I've never known anyone to can them any other way than a jam or a preserve. I never have either. That's why I was wondering yeah. what else would you do with them? Yeah. Um, I you wouldn't, you wouldn't, want to grill them or or any of the other methods I can think of you would do with figs because the texture is going to be off um you know when and once you put them through any sort of uh cooking process it's going to change the texture of them I'm looking at this recipe and they're they're basically uh pre preserving them in a syrup yes, yes. In, yeah and an acidified they syrup so you could probably just eat them in a bowl or as part of a fruit would salad be wonderful I could see that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can we try it? <laughs> First, uh, let's grow enough to do something is, with. <laughs> our right. speakers do uh, remind us it's good to think about how are you going to use these foods later? You know, it might help you determine which methods you want to do. Um, someone did want to um, just wanted to clarify do you need to wash herbs before freezing them? The answer is yes. You know, really, with very few exceptions, it's best to wash your um, yeah. produce before you freeze them. So Definitely. get rid of dirt and bugs. And yeah. once mm -hmm. it's thawed, you know, it's a um, they're too soft. You can't get rid of them. Right. What's the best right. way to store the dried herbs? Um, I always put them in an airtight jar. Yep, mm -hmm. I do too. Airtight jar. Mm -hmm. Um, that fits on, you know, in my herb spice and herb cabinet, and I label them, make sure I know which is which, and uh, they're great. And I try not to have like get a jar where you don't have a lot of head space because that's going to be moist great. air in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so fit the jar to the amount of herb that you have so that you don't have a lot of air in the jar. Small jars. I used to small use jars. Jars. Yeah, small ball, even the really small ones. Yeah. So we only have a couple more minutes. I'm going to um, uh, take one or two more questions, but at the same time, I'm launching a poll and we'd really appreciate it if you would take this poll. It's 10 questions. The last answer is always prefer not to respond. And this poll asks for some demographics, which are, um, bosses want us to collect and right, we collect for our data nationally. Uh, this is anonymous, so we can't tie it to you particularly, um, but we'd really appreciate if you would complete that. Someone said they used to, uh, grandfather made fresh cherries and brandy for the holidays. Do we have yes. a canning procedure for those? Um, no. I, Joanna and I have had this one procedure. quite a few times. I have <laughs> seen that method and you could refrigerate them and yeah. save them for a fair amount of time, I would believe. Yeah, underscore fair amount of time. Yeah. Not, you know, not a year, not. Right, something. yeah. I mean, I think a couple of weeks, they would probably keep a couple of weeks in a brandy yeah. um, syrup. But I, I'd have to look, do a little bit more looking. I don't know whether that you could can it. 
You know what um, works well with cherries yeah. that I've been doing? I love cherries. Um, so I have a pitter, which makes kind of a mess, but it works. Um, and I, I pit some that I have, you know, when it's time to do something with them, put them in a Ziploc. Of course, I wash them first, pit them, and then put them in a, um, a Ziploc freezer bag and label them. And then they're good to go for a lot of things. I kind of like it. Yeah. yeah. Cherries are one of my favorite. I have some fresh ones in the refrigerator. So. Mm -hmm. um, we're happy to have you join us today. I would we thank all of our panelists for being part of it. And oh, I want to.